We're going to uh, read uh, our Bible passage that we're looking at today. It comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 19. So when Jesus had finished instructing the twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. And then he did... What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. It is he of whom is written, Behold, I send my messengers before your face, and who will prepare your way before you? Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and laws prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But, what shall I, uh, but to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came e neither eating or drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Well, may the Lord add his understanding to that passage for us. Uh, before we dive in, let's have a quick word of prayer. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, as we open this, uh, your word and, and, and seek to understand it, give us ears to hear so that we can hear your word and put it into practice in our lives. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, most houses have one of these appliances. It's a microwave. Uh, it's become a standard appliance today. Uh, and uh, these, this thing, an MRI machine, it's an essential tool in uh, many major hospitals. Uh, they, they're there to assist in the identification of diverse medical conditions. Both of these ubiquitous uh, devices and invaluable machines sort of owe their creation or their existence to the pioneering work of this guy here, Isidore Isaac Rabi. Now, his groundbreaking uh, discoveries of nuclear magnetic resonance in 1944 earned him a Nobel, Peace Pr uh, Nobel Prize in physics. And if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have our microwaves and our MRI machines. So next time you heat up a meat pie in your microwave, you can thank him for it. But uh, one, of, one of his friends was asking him uh, how he became a scientist. Wh why did you become a scientist? Or what made you become a scientist? And he replied that every day after school, his mother would talk to him about school, but she, wasn't, she didn't say the things that most parents would, would ask questions. She inquired, uh, she always asked this one question. She said, did you ask a good question today? And so he said to his mate, uh, asking good questions has made me become a scientist. Now let me go one step further and say that there is one crucial question that you need to ask yourself. Everyone needs to ask themselves this question. And the answer holds immense significance, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And that question is, who is Jesus to you? And this is the question that our passage today asks. Uh, in the past weeks, we've sort of explored the amazing deeds performed by Jesus during his ministry. And at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist, the guy who asked him the question, 
uh, actually answered that question without being asked. Uh, in John chapter 1, verse 29, he saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist knew who Jesus was, or at least he thought he did. But now as our passage begins, John's currently languishing in jail uh, and he's doubting who Jesus is. He's been in prison due to the, due to sin, the sin of others, not his own. And the reason he's in prison is because he dared to speak the truth. And now he's facing execution for that. And I'm guessing he's wondering why he's in prison while those who put him there are not being held account for their sins. And although John the Baptist understood the consequences of the Lamb of God's arrival into this earth, I believe he's still sort of expecting a physical confrontation, a, a coup, an uprising, uh, which reflected the prevalent beliefs of the day. But this hasn't happened yet. God's Messiah hasn't broken him out of jail yet. Uh, maybe he was expecting an army of angels. Maybe he was expecting an army of men to storm the prison. Uh, maybe you can hear him asking, how about a little earthquake? No. What's going on? Why is nothing happening the way it's supposed to happen? So he sends some of his disciples to Jesus to ask about his identity. So if you've got your Bibles with you uh, today, open them to uh, Matthew chapter 11 and we'll start at uh, verse 2. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and he said to him, Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Now before we go on, let me ask you that question. Is Jesus the one for you? Is he the one in your life? Or are you looking for another? Matthew 11 provides us with three important things to consider when we are going to answer this question. And so here's the first consideration. If Jesus is the one, then we can have hope. Take a look at Jesus' response in verse 4. Uh, yep, verse 4. Uh, Jesus answered them, Go tell John what you did see, what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear and the dead are raised. The poor have good news preached to them. So what Jesus is doing here is he's realigning John's thinking with this answer. Uh, his response is actually rich in Old Testament allusions. Uh, in the language that he uses, he picks up the language of Isaiah 35, like the, one, uh, the, the passage we read this morning. He also uh, picks up uh, Isaiah 61 as well, which are passages that speak about the coming of the Messiah and the kingdom of God that the Messiah inaugurates. So what he's essentially saying here is that uh, he's saying, remember Isaiah's words about the miraculous things that will happen when the Messiah comes. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, dead will be risen, and the good news will be preached to the poor. All these predicted events from the book of Isaiah are now unfolding before your eyes. Uh, so, Jesus' miracles and actions provide ample evidence of the identity of the one who is to come, the, prophet is the prophesied Messiah. And the issue lies in the fact that everyone anticipated the kingdom of God to arrive like a tremendous tsunami. Uh, impact, like a tremendous impact, like a tsunami that comes in, sweeps over the entire earth and instantly brings about change. However, the reality of it is that the kingdom of God resembles more of a tide, um, gradually advancing, but with unwavering determination. And it's, uh, it's, it has not yet reached its complete fulfillment. Even now, in the present, it remains incomplete. But it has started, and it is progressing slowly and surely. And the tide, even though it hasn't fully engulfed us yet, it has arrived. If it had arrived like a tsunami, John wouldn't be confined in prison. 
facing imminent execution. Yet the unveiling of the kingdom of God has indeed taken place. Good things are happening. Jesus is healing the sick, raising the dead, and preaching the gospel. You can say, uh, use a different analogy, the kingdom of light is intruding in on the kingdom of darkness. So Jesus says to John's disciples, go, tell John, I am the one. I am the one who is to come. Look for no other. Now later on in Matthew uh, chapter 13, Jesus will explain this uh, by using the parable of the weeds. Uh, but that's still to come. However, uh, this doesn't mean, well, this, how, this does mean, the fact that the tide is coming in. It means that we can have hope. We can be confident that God is doing something magnificent. And take heart because God is rolling out his grand project to right what is wrong, to save what is lost, and to restore what has been ruined. Not only in this sin-weary world, or as Alistair put it this morning, in this sin-marred world. Think of it as uh, like, think of sin as like an affection, uh, sorry, an infection. <laughs> An infection in the body, and the kingdom of God is like a course of antibiotics. You know, to treat an infection, a course of antibiotics is given to target the bacteria causing the illness. Uh, and it's important for the patients to take the full course of antibiotics, even if they start feeling better before the course is finished. Because a successful recovery depends on sticking to the treatment plan and being patient during the healing process. And so if you believe that Jesus is the one, God's promised cure for the disease of sin, the hope for mankind, then you need to live each and every day as if the kingdom has already come and come in its fullness. Think about how this perspective would uh, influence our behaviour and our decision making. If we uh, acted as if Jesus was our real leader, not Albo, uh, not Biden, not King Charles, then we should show love and forgiveness to others uh, and not let resentment and fear influence our actions. And if we acted like that, we would be part of the kingdom's healing force. Our transformed lives would be evidence that the kingdom has been launched and Jesus would be revealed as the one. Can those of us who are Christian here today say that we are living in this manner? When we think about who Jesus is to us, the first thing to consider is that he is the one. He is the one to come, or he has come, but he is the one for us. If he is, if he is the one, then we can have hope and we should live each day as if the kingdom of God has already come in its fullness. Now, our uh, reception, well, the, second, the second consideration uh, has to do with Jesus' reception, how he is received. So if in verse 12, is that where we are? Verse, I think verse 12 is up there. Uh, we just want to have a look at verse 12. In verse 12, Jesus continues by saying, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. And the violent take it by force. That's a really weird statement, isn't it? It's, something, it's a somewhat difficult statement and it raises many questions as to what's going on. And, and honestly, uh, there's a lot of interpretations as to what this verse means. And quite a few of them, I believe, are valid. There's different layers there. But uh, to, to briefly explain it, let me say that Jesus is not talking about persecution here. He's not talking about anything like that. In fact, he's not talking about anything negative at all. He's talking about something that is very positive. He, he's talking about how people will receive him as the one. The violent here are those who are desperate to get into the kingdom. They are those who really desire to enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you know anything about uh, Reformed theology or Presbyterian theology, you know that salvation is all of God. God is the one who calls you. 
But when it comes to salvation, it's God who does all the work. And the theological word for that is monergism. But you and I, basically what that means is that you and I don't contribute anything at all to our own salvation. It's God who calls, God who saves, God who brings us into the kingdom. So if it's solely God's choice as to who gets saved and who enters the kingdom, how do we understand people's intense effort to enter it? Uh, so intense that Jesus describes it as violent. Well, let me explain it as this. Uh, when God goes to work in us, the Spirit of God stirs us into action. And that surge that Jesus calls uh, here a violent force doesn't come from within us, but rather it comes from without. Uh, it comes from God himself, from the Holy Spirit. He activates us. He energizes us. And because of what he does in us, the thing we want most is him. We want to live in that kingdom. We want to live under his rule. We want him to be the one and only. And nothing is more important than that. So let me ask you the following question. Is there anything more important to you than that? Do you possess that sense of urgency, that energy that resembles violence, to put it the way Jesus does here? Do you feel a desire about the things of God that drives you, that tugs at you, that pulls you in his direction? That's quite confronting, I think, just thinking about it as myself. Um, I wonder how many of us who are long-term Christians feel that violence, that urgency, that desire for the things of God. But whether you're a Christian or not, if you don't have that desire to be part of the kingdom of God, to put it ahead of all else, then don't hesitate any further. Pray now and plead with him to fill you with that desire for him above everything else. Uh, then when you go home, get alone with God and, and plead with him urgently, plead with him violently, if you know what I mean, <laughs> for this to happen. And if you don't yet want his rule with all your heart, Pray until you do. Ask until the desire is given. Take heaven by force, if you must, but take it. Make the desire for Jesus to be above everything else, to be the most important part of your life. The unfortunate thing is that many people don't see Jesus as important. They may use his name as a profanity, but they never call on his name for salvation. And that brings us to the third consideration of this passage, and that is the rejection of the one who is to come. We've seen the, the revelation of Jesus as the one, as the Messiah. And we've seen how he's been received. Now we see, uh, we'll see how he is rejected. If we look at verses uh, 16, uh, Jesus asks, he, he's asked his disciples, he said, but to what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in a marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a dirge for you, but you didn't mourn. What's happening here is these children are complaining because their playmates won't play with them. It's a simple game. Why won't you cooperate with us? In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, John and I tried to get you to play a game with us, but it didn't matter whether it was a funeral or a wedding Whatever it was, you wouldn't play. We played the flute for you, you didn't dance. We wailed and we mourned, you didn't join in. And he points out that while he and John had the same message, they used different approaches. Uh, yet Jesus' generation had complaints about both approaches. And I think we can see that in our generation today as well. The children's complaint in verse 17 seems to emphasize that no matter what tune is played, people are not happy. Nor are those happy who do not want to repent at the coming of the kingdom. They will reject the messenger no matter how they bring the message. And just in case the, the people listening to Jesus didn't understand that uh, illustration, he continues his point by outright saying, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. 
The Son of Man, he's talking about himself there, came eating and drinking and they say, look at him, he's a glutton, he's a drunkard. And here's the point. People will reject Jesus. They will reject his rule. They will reject his kingdom. They will reject him as a person. But what does Isaiah say about the one who was to come? What does Isaiah say about the, the Messiah? He says, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected. And that's the basis of sin. We all have this tendency to despise and reject Jesus. Unless the Holy Spirit moves within us, to see him for who he truly is, the one. Otherwise, we're looking for someone else. So if you have any, uh, any inclination to embrace Jesus, give in to it. That's, that's God calling you. That's the Holy Spirit moving in you. That's how it happens. God calls you. And we can see through this throughout the Bible. Uh, the Apostle Paul refers to it as the calling to which you've been called. Peter, the Apostle Peter, uh, names it your call and election. And that's how it starts. It doesn't start with you and me. It starts with God. He calls us. It's the Holy Spirit who opens our ears to hear the call. And with ears to hear, remember how Jesus himself says in verse 15 of our text. He says, let anyone who has ears listen. And when the Spirit gives you ears to hear, he opens your eyes to see. So look upon Jesus and no longer will you despise him. No longer will you reject him. You will see him as he is. You'll see him as the fairest of 10,000, uh, the bright and morning star, the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. He becomes your one and only. So let, let me finish up with uh, the question that I asked at the start. Who was Jesus to you? Who is he? In the last verse of our passage today, we find Jesus acknowledging that there are those who will reject him. Uh, he says, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Or in other words, wisdom is justified by the evidence According to Paul, Jesus has come, become for us the wisdom from God. So ask yourself, has Jesus been justified to you? Is there any evidence to verify his claim to be what God reveals him to be? If so, rejoice, give thanks, and get down on your knees uh, and give thanks because of what it means. And that, what it means is that the Spirit of God is at work in your heart to make Jesus the one. And there is no one else that you need to look for. Well, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you uh, for keeping your promises about sending the Son, the Messiah, the one who is to come, the one who is to uh, start the kingdom of God and, and fix this world-weary, uh, sin-weary world. Lord, we pray that we will be prepared to, to listen and to receive what Jesus teaches about himself and not reject him. But Lord, we also pray for those who may be struggling with doubts. We pray that they won't take offence of Jesus and that you will stir their hearts so that they will have that urgency to, to reach out, to, to grasp upon you, uh, grasp you and the kingdom uh, and become one of your children. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name.